I'm going to keep it a little bit light. I mean, the, the topic of what are consumers looking for, what are they asking for, um, you know, they, they certainly, we, we serve millions of customers a day in the United States, and so they certainly don't have any problem speaking their mind to us. And so I just kind of wanted to share a little bit of insight. Now, I need to apologize up front. I, I buy about 800 million pounds of beef a year uh, for the U.S., and uh, about uh, 170, 180 million pounds uh, of uh, pork. I could have very easily made this pork, and if I would have seen all the pork sponsorships of pork people around here, I might have switched it up. But you'll notice it's focused, focused on beef. And maybe it's a little easier for me, and I'm just lazy. But uh, here we go. Most of the stuff I'm talking about here becomes pretty interchangeable, whether you're talking about cattle or pigs. So with that, oh, that's right, right here. Again, we serve millions of customers a day. And uh, we actually have, have gone over the, about the last 10 years, we've made it very, very easy for these customers to reach us. We have websites. We have 800 numbers on our cups and packaging. You know, we really want to hear from their customers. What are they interested in? What are they worried about? What do they care about? Um, we, again, we started off as a burger chain uh, 53 years ago now. So beef is very, very uh, front and center to our business, as is really agriculture in general. You know, uh, this is one of my absolute favorite slides because it's just not about beef. It's just about beef for me, but uh, the only thing we buy more of than beef at 800 million pounds is potatoes. And I, th I always tease the potato buyer because that's just because they get a really bad yield. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, 600 million eggs, I mean, if, if it's animal agriculture, we're in there. And if we buy anything, we buy lots of it. So real quick, I just kind of, the first part of this is going to be more about McDonald's and kind of how, how, how we work with our customers, how we listen to our customers and what they're telling us. Um, what they tell us, they want value. Well, again, our responsibility to respond to that, and uh, I think we've been doing a pretty good job, especially over the last five or six years. Uh, they want variety. Again, you know, as the beef guy, it kind of bothered me a little bit that we got so into chicken, but we've been very, very successful with chicken products, salads, and other items. And you know we continue to grow beef every year as well, so I guess it's good news for everybody. Um, and they're also they are interested in healthy lifestyles. And I mean a lot of this is uh, what they hear about and read about, but uh, they are concerned with it for themselves and for their children. But this is a big one right here, and uh, what they see, read here, it does affect their buying decisions. Um, in, in the case of some of the things that have been discussed earlier with outbreaks and tracebacks and recalls, it may not be a permanent change in their behavior, but it does affect their behavior either short term or long term. And they can get bombarded with information, blackberries, televisions, newspapers, magazines, you name it, movies now. I mean, feature movies about information that they should know about their food. There's just inundated with information. A lot of it does concern them. I mean, there's some clips from Mad Cow. Uh, you, could, you could add latest uh, food scandal or latest food issue and come up with the same number of clippings. Um, I used to have a really ugly picture from the uh, Hallmark incident, but I decided to turn it around and lighten it up, and actually now I have a picture of proper animal handling with Temple Grandin at the helm here. I just thought that it was a little less shocking, so trying to keep this a little lighter. So again, they want value, they want variety, they are interested in health, but what they hear does affect their buying decisions. So traceability at McDonald's, and Paul actually stole a lot of my thunder on this one, so thanks, Paul. Um, as a large company and a very, very visible brand, uh, one, of, one of my primary responsibilities to protect that brand and really everybody that works in the company has that responsibility is to protect that brand so traceability I'll talk a little bit about what we do with beef first off we've got it pretty well sorted and I don't mean that to sound conceited or arrogant but we have it pretty well sorted because we have to from the meat to the restaurants so we have a select group of suppliers so we don't have to look at every source of beef if there's a problem we know where we got all our beef from when the uh, cow that stole Christmas, I was on vacation in Phoenix, I got a phone call, do we buy beef from them? I very easily off the top of my head said no. I mean, I know the list, I know who we buy our raw materials from, so it was very easy trace back for us. Um, we do finished raw material lot tracking. What that means is a lot of raw materials, even though they're from approved suppliers, we know when those are incorporated in ground beef patties, and so we can actually trace that into individual cases 
or on z it said another way is I can turn over a case, look at a specific code, go look it up on a computer, and I know exactly what raw material lots are in that case. Um, we have a dedicated distribution system, so I don't really even have to worry about uh, transportation and trucks. We have our own standards for how, even how, what kind of seals the trucks use, you know, when they're loaded and sealed before they're sent into the distribution channels. We have a dedicated distribution system. So I have a lot of advantages, so a lot of these things come pretty easy and natural. We, we pretty much know how much of what is used where. And from, again, from the meat forward, from the packing house forward, we got it pretty well covered. So why am I up here talking about traceability and animal ID? Well, we'll get to that. So what about our beef? Um, Paul also talked about private company standards. Here's a pretty short list. We have our own standards for animal welfare. We have our own standards for how they do their processes in the plants to handle any potential BSE issues. Uh, we actually audit against the ruminant meat and bone meal ban. Personally, it's not something we have to do. It's a law, but we audit against it anyway. Um, we have HACCP standards. We have sampling plans for the raw materials. And then we, you know, the, the, uh, the list on the, uh, on the left is what the raw material goes through. The list on the right is what the finished patties go through. We have sustainability standards, and those kind of go back through to our grinders, the people who are making our patties for us. Are they, are they doing their best to save energy and water and these kind of things? We have uh, finished product testing, so we test the raw material for pathogens, and we test the finished patties as well. Uh, again, HACCP, SPC, it's a long list. You see at the bottom of both lists, though, we're actually involved and very dependent on USDA FSIS. 100% of our beef is USDA inspected and passed. Paul also stole that thunder, too. Thank you, Paul. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, after all that, where does source verification fit in, and why is it important, or, or why do I care? Oh, and Paul, I did have a picture for you that I could steal from you. You talked about the double tag calf. This is a UK double tag calf. It has redundant tagging in both ears almost from the, day, from the moment it's born. Shifting gears a little bit now, let's talk about outside of McDonald's. Just in terms of meat, or actually just in terms of food, I'll focus it back down to meat. You know, consumer demand, consumer questions, what am I looking for? I mean, here's a steak. I get off burgers too. You know, what do they want from this steak? Well, the traditional things we look for, they want it to taste good. They want it to be tender. They want it to be lean or, you know, in the case of Wagyu, not lean. Um, now they're starting to get a little deeper, humanely treated. I mean, the Hallmark thing actually took people off of beef a little bit. I mean, we saw the impact of that. It had nothing to do with us. It affected our business. It affected the beef business. Um, now you can throw down a bunch of things list. Locally grown. That used to mean our standard for locally grown means we sourced from the countries uh, in which we did business first. Um, now that means 50 miles or 100 miles away from where it's being consumed. So the definitions of some of these have changed. Organic, grass-fed, natural, a lot of these things were, were already discussed. And a big et cetera because there is always another one coming. There's always another five of these coming. Um, again, back, they are influenced by what they see, read, and hear. But also as critical is what are they trying to avoid? And understand too, this is feedback from customers. When there's an expose on um, antibiotic use in animal agriculture, we're inundated with calls about, well, is this true? What are you doing about it? You know, it's, uh, and are you, are you getting, are you getting uh, any swine, any, any pork from the swine affected by melamine? I mean, they call us, and they call our investor relations group. I mean, things that happen even outside of our business can impact our business, can impact the entire industry. So these are, these are actual things I've had to answer in the past. So what am I trying to avoid? Well, same steak. Uh, maybe they're trying to avoid hormones, herbicides, pesticides, antibiotics. I mean, we all know this list. We see it all the time. Clones. And this is a, one that I've kind of summed it up to myself is they're trying to avoid guilt. They don't want to feel guilty about what they're eating or what they're feeding to their children. So very, very important. They just want to enjoy the steak and not have to worry about all these things. I understand too. Every customer isn't worried about every one of these, but they're on the they're on the table now. They are growing, and more are coming behind them. The reason I'm going to stop here is because the next thing, if if you can't get past all those things, maybe that consumer is going to go and figure out they need to buy something else, and that hurts us all. 
you know, these are kind of the greens fees. We can talk about these a lot. You know, how do I know it's safe? How do I know it's what I wanted? Well, how do, this is what they all think they want. And you know, there's a lot of cattle producers in here, and I'm not going to, I'm not the person to argue this, but this is what they picture when they think of beef production. Uh, this is the reality. I know there's nothing wrong with this, but this doesn't meet their idyllic, you know, picture that they have painted in their mind. And how do they know if they want that, that they're not getting that? Well, this is a little chart we've done. We do this, we, this is actually a conglomeration of about three charts. And we've talked a lot, and in fact, even in this earlier session, they talked about the lack of faith that the customer has in the USDA, FDA. Uh, this is a little bit different. This isn't a popularity contest. This isn't how pleased they are with these organizations, but if someone is going to tell them that food is safe, or if someone's going to tell them food is not safe, who are they going to believe? Who do they trust? They still trust FDA, USDA, and scientists. And unfortunately, and I, you know, I have to put it in here, who do they not trust? Well, we're down there at the bottom. Um, but we're, we have a lot of good company down there as well. Uh, production sector isn't much better off than we are. They really need uh, to feel that they can trust the messaging they're getting from the government, whatever whatever uh, section of the government that might be. There is a good news to this, though. At least in this country, there's somebody that they trust. In other areas of the world, when issues come up and problems have happened in the past, if they don't trust anybody, that's when they stop buying meat or whatever the product is, and they don't come back. So at least they do trust somebody. They look for somebody to tell them, oh, there's a problem, but then they also wait for that somebody to tell them, okay, it's all right now. We got it. We got our arms around it. We had a competent response. Just another chart from another study, same thing. Just cuts out the middle guys. So again, uh, customer trust. They trust the government to assure food safety. This is the USDA inspected and passed seal. They also trust the government to assure claim integrity. You know, I have USDA choice up there. Quality grade is a claim in the minds of a consumer. If they're going to pay extra for primer choice, they expect it to be better. And they also expect that the government is kind of behind that because they are. And then USDA organic, that's just one example of another claim that they are looking for government agencies or somebody to verify for them. Um, source verification. Now we're getting into the question that I asked right up front. Source verification is an important tool for protecting this trust. Why is it important? I said I'd get to the answer. Federal agencies and scientists are who consumers look to. We talked about that. Source verification is an important tool. You heard them up here say that themselves. I look at when anything happens, whether it's peanut butter, spinach, tomatoes, uh, melamine and feed or inhumane handling of livestock there's either a scandal or there's a true crisis consumers will step away we've seen it repeatedly now how long they step away in our minds depends on the competency and speed of the response i look at bse bse was probably the most serious thing we had in the beef business that could have potentially damaged our industry in a long time but if you remember within weeks customers you know, U.S. customers were back on. Now, the international world's taken quite a bit longer, but our U.S. customers really didn't skip much of a beat, but I remember very specifically that there were very quick, very competent responses. They got their arms around it. They traced it very quickly. Again, thank goodness it was a Canadian cow, but they assured the customer, that, hey, we have, it. we have our arms around it. We have it sorted. We're in good shape, and they came back to us. Peanut butter took a long time. It was actually months. Our store had, there was a lot of empty shelf space in the peanut butter area for, it seemed like months after this, I thought the whole thing had been cleared up. I was looking for some peanut butter. So again, source verification becomes an important tool for protecting our industry. If we are the best, we need to be able to prove it. That's, that's kind of my statement, but really it, it goes back to what we say. If we say we only use animals from, uh, or from packing houses that treat their animals humanely, I can't print fiction. We have to go and look. We have to go and audit every year or twice a year. We have to make sure that what we're saying as a claim is true. Well, the same thing kind of goes for the industry as a whole. If we're going to say we're the best, and I truly believe we are, then we need to have a way to prove it. All comes down to claims, and all comes down to providing claim assurance to the customer.